down at Fox Crossing. And um, I hope I get this right. We have two slots for village trustee, and we have four candidates. Um, so you can vote for, for um, trustee number four position, either Mark Engelbert, who is the incumbent, and he's to my immediate right, or Josh Finch, who's next to him on his right. And for village trustee number two, um, we have Nick Gebert, and we have Chris Kepi, who's the incumbent. Okay, and I think same ground rules apply as earlier. If you haven't submitted a question but would like to, um, please um, raise your hand if you have a question. And we have some cards that you can write on, and um, they'll submit the league representatives will collect your question and submit it to me um, during the forum. And again, we'll start with opening statements from each of the candidates. And um, we'll, I think, just go down the row. And in that order, we'll stay in that order for questioning. Um, so you'll be first this time and last next time. Um, so Mr. Engelberg, let's start with your opening statement. Three minutes. I'd like to thank everybody for being here. My name is Mark Engelbert. Uh, I've been on the Village Board for the last three years. Um, I would like to thank the, uh, the League for hosting this great forum. Uh, and uh, I look forward to uh, interacting with the, uh, with the audience because you guys are the most important people here tonight. You guys want to hear uh, things from us and what we're thinking uh, as we run for office. Uh, I grew up in Menasha. Um, I'm a Menasha kid. Uh, I, uh, I went to Madison, got a civil engineering degree, uh, and then I went into the United States Navy, um, which was probably the best, the best decision I ever made. Uh, I grew up in the Navy, became a man in the Navy. Um, I, uh, I commanded a, a cruiser. I, uh, I had uh, two deployments to the Middle East. Um, I had deployments to Africa, South America, and I learned a lot in my uh, experience as a naval officer uh, and did a lot of engagement with other countries in diplomacy, which is a primary job of a naval officer, diplomacy with our allies and diplomacy with our other countries. Uh, I spent uh, three years at the Pentagon also, which was a sentence by my detailer, and I looked for parole opportunities at every minute, uh, but it did, it did give me a good idea of how government works, and especially the federal government, and you guys don't want to hear everything I learned about the federal government, I can guarantee you that. But. Um, uh, I, I always knew that I would come back to Menasha area. I, I fell in love with Fox Crossing. I've been here since 2011, and uh, um, I, I have uh, a lovely woman at home. My son lives uh, in uh, Fox Crossing, and we love Fox Crossing. I'm proud to be a Fox Crossing resident. I also want you to know there's a lot of positive uh, positive news for Fox Crossing. For the last three years, we've kept your tax rate. We've actually lowered your tax rate. We we have uh, we have grown the tax base, and we've attracted a lot of businesses to Fox Crossing. So there's been nothing but good news for the last three years. So hopefully, you'll consider me on April 2nd. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Finch. I'll put that up there. Good evening. My name is Josh Finch. I want to thank you all for being out here tonight. Thank you to the League of Women Voters. What you all do is such an amazing thing. Um, like I said, my name is Josh Finch, and I was born and raised here in the village of Fox Crossing. And I attended UW Stevens Point for my undergraduate degree. In 2018, I graduated with a Bachelor of Arts Management. And currently, I attend UW Oshkosh for my Master's of Public Administration. When not in school, I work for Winnebago County Parks, and I've been employed with them for going on five years. I'm heavily involved in different fine arts organizations within ours and surrounding communities. I attend St. Gabriel's Archangel Church in Nina, and I've been ushering for going on a decade. 
a little bit about my campaign. In the end of October of 2018, I decided to begin considering running. I began going around to different neighborhoods between the Appleton, Nina, and Menasha's zip code, and just trying to talk with anybody that would be willing to speak with me. After speaking with a lot of people, I contemplated it and contemplated it. I have heard comments about a dog park, questions about road repair, an increase in community development, a decrease in community development. But however, what really pushed me over was speaking with this wonderful elderly couple who lived off of Palmer Way. They have lived there for going on three decades, and during that time period, they have had many people come to their door asking for a signature and asking for their vote, but nothing more. And I think that it's so important that our elected officials are willing to go door to door and hear the concerns of the constituents, hear the ideas of the constituents, because I'm not elected for me, I'm elected for you, and I want to be the voice of the people for the people. Again, my name is Josh Finch, and I would like to take the opportunity to hear your concerns. Thank you. I'd like to thank the Women's League of Voters for holding and inviting me to this forum tonight, and I'd also like to thank those in the audience for attending. My name is Nick Yard, and I'm a candidate for Village Trustee C2. I'd like to share a little bit about myself. I'm married to my high school sweetheart, Dawn, and I have an energetic six-year-old who's attending Spring Road School. I was born in Theta Clark and grew up in Nina, playing a variety of sports for community teams, baseball, golf, and the best neighborhood football around. Soccer was my favorite. I graduated from Nina High School in 2000 and went into the workforce earning money to attend college. In fall of 2004, I started attending classes at our hometown UW Fox Valley and later transferred to UW Oshkosh where I graduated with a Bachelor's of Science degree. After college, I earned my insurance and security license to become a financial advisor. At the same time, me and my wife started an estate sale and service business. After working as an advisor for quite a few years, I decided that our business was successful enough that we would do that full time. There just wasn't the excitement of being an advisor that there is running your own business and having extra time to spend with your son. And now I'm asking for your vote. As village trustee, I pledge to maintain our high standards of vital services while ensuring responsible use for your taxpayer dollars without increasing our property taxes. I also support a resolution to be passed for term limits on elected officials with a maximum of five two-year terms. Term limits are nothing new, they go way back to ancient Rome, where the people in government had such a concentration of power that term limits were set for one term. But there was also pl plenty of corruption there to have that one term. Term limits are supported by 88.6% 88, of Green Bay voters, limiting stagnant politicians and voting their concentration of power. Term limits encourage new talent with fresh ideas, which could bring higher voter turnout to local elections. Qualified people with good ideas say they don't run for office because so-and-so have been there forever and I don't stand a chance of winning, leading to, cha leading to the no challenges and the incumbent is in for another term. Term limits could solve this and maybe add some more representatives from the east side of the bridge to join Barb. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. Thank you. Hi, my name is Chris Kennedy and I'm running for Village Trustee number two. Um, I don't particularly like talking about myself, but I think it's important that you get a little bit of an understanding of who I am and what I bring to the table for that position of trustee. Um, I'm married to my wife, Marina, 28 years. I am a taxpayer homeowner in the village for 28 years, so I understand the concerns of the taxpayers and the people that live here. I pay taxes, too, and I think that's important that you understand that I come to this position with that understanding that that's an important aspect that we all have to take a look at is the careful use of our tax dollars. Um, as far as my qualifications, I spent 16 years on the Planning Commission, which is a very important commission committee in this village. There's a lot of great things that start happening at that level um, that eventually come up to the board for some final decision-making process. Those 16 years talking a lot about how government works and how to get things done. And I think that's important. It makes no sense to stand outside and yell and scream. It makes a lot more sense to get involved 
and make change happen from within. That's the correct way to do it, and that's why I started with that planning commission. I thought that was a valuable place to get experience. I'm also the current chair and member of our sustainability committee. I've been the chair there for, I believe, six years now. Um, another one of the committees that's in this village that does a lot, a lot of really good things. I'm very proud to be a part of that committee and been able to be that chair for that period of time. As far as my background, I work in a business, uh, Jack's Maintenance, some of you may have heard of it. It's one of the larger employees, employers, I should say, in our community, over 475 employees and facility and safety manager uh, for Jack's Maintenance. Um, bring a lot of experience to this position simply by the work that I do. I have real world experience in solving problems. I also manage a fleet of well, it was 55 vehicles, I think it's going to jump up a few more in the next few weeks. So I understand what the costs are for maintaining equipment, vehicles. We have over 120 pieces of capital equipment, ranging from a $1.5 million fire truck to a couple hundred dollar chainsaw. We have to maintain those. I understand those types of things. We have over 100 employees. Some of those employees do some tasks that could be considered rather dangerous. As a safety manager, I understand those types of concerns and what an injury can do and how they can impact not only the person, but the people around them and our budget. Um, I say I only have a few seconds left. So let me just finish by saying the word trustee. It means you're entrusting something to somebody. By voting me, voting for Chris Kepi, trustee number two on April 2nd, you are entrusting me with your faith that I will do the job properly be a steward of the tax dollars and make sure that this village continues in the direction it's going right now, which I truthfully think is a very good direction. A lot of good things going on. Thank you. Thank you. One of our audience members wanted to know um, <laughs> essentially a job description for a trustee. Um, to describe how you feel about the um, or how you view the role and responsibility of being a trustee. And Mr. Kempe, we'll start with you this start. Well, as I just said, trustee means you're entrusted with something. Um, probably the most important thing that the board does every year is the budget. It's where we take your tax dollars and very carefully craft how we are going to spend them. Uh, I think that is probably the most important thing that the board is responsible for. We make a lot of other decisions along the way, but it's working with those tax dollars and understanding how they need to be split up. What are the priorities? Um, to me, that's that's really what it's all about. It's being responsible with the tax dollars. Thank you, Mr. Gebber. The role of the trustee to me is uh, exactly what Mr. Gebber said. It's uh, entrusting in us what we're going to do with your tax dollars. We want to make sure that there's responsible use of those. We want to make sure your vital services are taken care of. We don't want to see the need for raising of taxes. We want to make sure that the growth that's going on here in the village, we can use that uh, to prevent and uh, make sure maintenance is going on so we don't have any uh, reasons to raise your taxes in the future. Uh, there's a lot of growth going on, obviously, with the 441 interchange. Um, like I said, I want to make sure that that money is, is spent to prevent problems from happening because some of our pipes, some of our stuff in the in the village is quite old and uh, it needs to be replaced and I'd hate to see our taxes go up to replace it. I think we should be using our our newfound growth to, to pay for that. Mr. Finch. You know, that's a uh, very good question. And in my opinion, I want to say what the previous two had spoken. But I think there's something more to be said about it. It is the voice of the constituents, the voice of the people. And when I think of an elected official, what I would want from them, I don't want someone that's going to be on the back seat. I want someone that's going to be taking the charge, leading the way for not just you, but for everybody. And that's kind of how I view the position of trustee. Thank you. Mr. Engelbert. Well, really, the number one job of a trustee is to be a good steward of the taxpayer's money. That's the number one job, making sure that your money that you pay into the fund is being spent wisely and efficiently. We do a lot of things with budgets and capital improvement projects and trying to up 
uh, upgrade infrastructure, um, but we need to make sure we spend wisely. The other thing that I think a trustee has to do is he's got to look for ways to make things better in the uh, municipality, in the community. That me if that means engaging local, uh, other local officials in issues that are going on between boundaries, or if that means uh, engaging state officials like Senator Roth and trying to explain to him that our shared revenue system is not fair and that the village of Fox Crossing is getting screwed when it comes to <laughs> shared revenue every single year. Um, and I just talked to Senator Roth and my good friend, uh, Trustee McNamee, in the audience about that. Those are the things that you have to go out and do because re your the residents out there in the audience want us to do that and make sure that we have the funding and we're doing the things that we have to do so that their lives are better. So that's what a trustee really needs to do. Thank you. Thank you. There were a few questions about um, annexate, annexation. Um, how would you attempt to resolve the current annexation issues and what direction do you remember for recommend for the future, starting with Mr. Engelbert? Well, the way, you know, I grew up in Menasha a long time ago, and we weren't a metropolitan area at that point. There were actually gaps between Menasha and Appleton. The only thing that was a twin city were Nina Menasha and Nicolet Boulevard was uh, separating it. But we're starting to become a metro area. And therefore, we're going to have to start working with the towns on our borders uh, to, to di discuss what the future is going to be, and especially as we look west, because we, this, this metropolitan area is going to expand west. We have tried very hard uh, to sit down with, for example, the town of Clayton, and we continue to work very hard in trying to come up with a salvageable uh, agreement and on how to go. We would like to be good neighbors. I want to emphasize that. The Village of Fox Crossing, we think it's important to be good neighbors to the people on our boundaries. And we want to work with those people. And that's what, you know, what we do on the board when we talk about annexation. We talk about being good neighbors and working with other people and making sure that you know, both sides, uh, you know, can come to a compromise. So I think that's what's most important when we look at annexation on our boundaries. Thank you. Mr. Finch, same question. Now, that is a really good question. It's also a very difficult question because with dealing with the boundaries, you need to have trust. You need to have trust with the other officials between the different municipalities. And I think that it's important to have a, an, a, a, if you will, a gentleman's agreement, and you don't go back on your word. And that's something that we've kind of heard about in the news in the past few months between our fellow relatives of the, uh, the West. Um, growth is great. I don't think anybody is going to deny that. Uh, growth is important to be able to make, be sustainable. However, it's... It's finding the correct way to go about it. Uh, you take, for example, speaking of the town of Clayton, they're now actually in the process of becoming a village following our steps. And uh, according to their clerk, they're actually in the process of going to the court system in the beginning of May, May 9th. So it's really trying to figure out how we can come to terms with not necessarily just the town of Clayton, but the other city of Nina, town of Nina, city of Appleton, working with them, city of Menasha, making sure that we can be agreeable and also working towards a common goal. Thank you. Mr. Gebert. Well, annexation issues go back many years. Um, town of Menasha had an agreement with the city of Menasha to uh, not annex our, our property but uh, problems were being had with Menasha, and that's why we became a village 
And when we were becoming a village, the town of Menasha was so upset that they were annexing us. So it's kind of funny now to hear that the town or the village, now that we are a village, wants to go and annex everybody else. So I find it not surprising that uh, the, the town of Clayton wants to become a village, based that we're quite hypocritical here in the village, because you know we were so against you know being annexed, and it was such a bad thing. Except when the shoes on the other foot, it's it's so great. I also do agree with Mr. Finch, though. However, growth is good, but what is the cost of that growth, and what is the value you're going to gain through that cost? and uh, through that annexation. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kevin. Well, if I understood the correction, <clears throat> the question correctly, there wasn't a specific about what we were doing in terms of annexation. It just was, what is annexation about? And if I can respond to that, one of the reasons we incorporated was to protect our boundaries because if you look at the east side, it's so scattered and broken up from annexations that Appleton did, uh, city of, of Nina. Um, the east side is just a real problem in terms of how the properties are all broken up. It's not a contiguous type of uh, a, a city like it should be. Um, I know that there was some questions asked because I was involved in the incorporation process both on the planning committee uh, commission and um, not so much on the board but in the process of uh, bringing the east side back in. And I can tell you that at no time did I hear any discussion on either board members, planning committee, commission members, that the reason we decided to incorporate is because we wanted to annex properties? Never heard it. I don't believe it was ever discussed. So I want to make that very clear. That was not the reason we proceeded with incorporation. It was to protect our boundaries. In terms of the discussion that was being had with Clayton, they approached us. We did not go to them and say, we are going to annex your properties if this or that doesn't happen. There are some landowners on Clayton that have boundaries next to ours that asked us if they could be annexed in because they wanted sewer and water service. It wasn't us going to them, it was them coming to us. So I just want to make that very clear because it's a little bit confusing. Sometimes it gets to be a little bit uh, erroneous in how it's being reported, but we as a village have never had an intention, never been discussed at any level that I'm aware of, that annexing other people's property, other area community properties was why we incorporated. Thank you, Mr. Kepi. And you um, raised the east side, west side concerns um, in your last remarks, um, and this question has to do with that. How do the needs of the east side of Fox Crossing differ from the needs of the west side? And if elected, how will you work to make sure that these unique needs are met? Well, I guess I would start by saying I, I always have difficulty in thinking of us as an east and west side community. I prefer to think of us as a village that's separated by a body of water. Um, both sides have common needs. I think we all would agree that property taxes, schools, roads, I mean, those are some common things that both east and west would look at and saying these are of value to us, these are important to us. Um, one of the issues that you do have to be aware of, though, is the east side is a older part of the village, uh, more mature, so they maybe have some slightly different needs in terms of that. There was some mention about infrastructure and, and sewer and water needing to be replaced over there. Uh, in the last couple of years, we've spent somewhere around seven or eight million dollars on improving infrastructure on just the east side. So it's not like they're the stepchild or the forgotten part of the village. Uh, we do everything we can to make sure that all of these things are taken care of. Um, I just really prefer to think of it as, well maybe the one difference that I'll, I will bring up is that there's a lot of mature trees on the east side. Leaf collection has been a problem that we've had discussions about for quite a long time. It's not that big of an issue on the west side because we have ditches and, and probably far fewer mature trees. So yeah, there is a little bit of a difference there and I think I'll just leave it at that. Mr. Gebert, same question. Well yeah, I don't think that we differ at all. I think the uh, only thing we differ by is we're connected by a bridge. I think the east side could use some more representation on the board, however. There was only one out of seven that is uh, representing the east side, and that's Barb Hansen. I'm um, going off what Mr. Kepi says with le leaf collection. I know the east side has some problems. The west side also does, and I've talked to a lot of residents about getting a leaf collection system going. And uh, I was on the board, actually, in 2013 and discussed this many a times, and to find out it was only going to cost us $5 or so, or maybe a little bit more, one time to uh, collect leaves to buy a leaf collection device. 
and then also you know maintenance and everything else as it uh, went on. But most people spend more than five dollars on bags to get their leaves collected, and uh, I talk to a lot of my neighbors, and it's backbreaking work. It takes hours to load these bags, and I was an advocate for this leaf collection system before. I'd be an advocate for it again. Um, it's something we obviously need. Um, it's sad. It's, it's really sad to see that uh, we spend money to get the stuff picked up and goes to the dump. We could be getting that stuff and uh, getting mulch for our gardens and things like that also. So, leaf collection is a, a big thing that probably should be addressed here in the in the village. Thank you, Mr. Finch. Yeah, I uh, I agree with the previous two, especially about how there isn't really too much difference besides the infrastructure and, as Mr. Kippy said, the leaves. Um, I do think that we really should try to get more representation on the east side. I know that there had been some discussion about uh, making this into more of an automatic system. I don't know if that's actually something that can be done. I know that's something that had been discussed at some point, but I don't think that discussion went very far at all. Uh, but I, I definitely think that there needs to be some way that we can try to push forward more representation across the board from the Appleton, Menasha, and the Nina side of things. Thank you. Mr. Engelbert. Well, there are some differences between the east side and west side, but small. I would say that I agree with representation. You got four west siders here, by the way, so that's not going to be solved tonight, that issue. <laughs> Um, <laughs> sure. uh, you know, we got problems with uh, aging um, infrastructure on the east side. They're older over there than the west side. Um, as far as the islands, they're harder to, si as we call these islands, as you guys know, those, those pockets of land that, uh, you know, the city of Menasha and the city of Appleton and next around. They're harder to service, there's no doubt about it. I, I think the fire chief and the police chief would tell you that, that it's, it's a little harder to service that, trying to figure out you know, who, who's in the city of Menasha, who's in uh, the village of Fox Crossing. Um, so you know, there's some challenges, but we've always met every challenge when it comes. There's no challenge that, that's come up between east side, west side. Personally, I live on Strobe Island, so I don't consider myself a west side or east sider, by the way. I consider myself right in the middle. Uh, the one thing that the east side has, though, uh, that the west side doesn't have is a grocery store. And we don't have uh, a grocery store on the west side. And um, that's something that I would like to, uh, to have the village start pushing harder for is to get a, a grocery store over here. Um, they've got some nice stuff over there with Piggly Wiggly and Festival, and, and we don't have anything here on the, on, uh, on the west side. So, so for you east siders, you got something we don't have that we would like. Thank you. This question has to do with roads and taxes. The town has one of the lowest tax rates in the entire state. At the same time, the town has deferred needed repair or rebuilding of some roads. According to the town's road superintendent, the cost of the repairs and rebuilds could approach $1 million. How would you propose to raise the money necessary to deal with these and future road projects? Mr. Engelbert, first. Well, I mean, the, the, the easiest way, well, first of all, I don't know if that's true that we've deferred uh, a lot of road construction, uh, but... Um, the easiest way to do that is to increase the tax base, and we've done a great job of that. And I think in the last three years, you know, through attracting businesses like Secura, Community First, Wow, um, you know, Theta Care, um, and and those kind of businesses, we've uh, uh, increased our equalized value by seventy-five million dollars, and we're putting those businesses in places that make sense. You know, we're putting them where they don't impact um, the residents very much. I mean, there's always traffic problems. The other thing that we need to do is fix this shared revenue thing. I'm going to go back to that. Menasha gets $3.3 million in shared revenue every year. Well, last year they did, and we get $345,000 in shared revenue. That shared revenue formula hasn't been updated since 2001. A lot has changed from the town of Menasha to the village of Fox Crossing, and 
the state legislature needs to relook at the uh, that formula, institute something because we are now bigger than Menasha, and we should be. I'm not saying that we should get as much as they do, but we should get significantly more money in shared revenue. If we had that kind of money, we would be able to put more money into roads, infrastructure, and things like that. That would be a smart thing to do, uh, and I think we, I'm going to keep pushing uh, Senator Roth and Roarcast and others to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Finch. Mr. Engelbert brought up a lot of good points, especially dealing with the shared revenue. Actually, that's something that I had a conversation with uh, Representative Rorkast about at his uh, budget session uh, last past Friday. And I think it's important that uh, we don't, and, and it, it's hard to find the way to actually increase revenue. But I, I do agree that finding some type of increase in businesses it's a, a really good thing and i think something that we can do with that is working with our community development to bring in and attract more businesses and more companies to try and help offset the cost with that uh, i do wanted to note that uh, some of those companies that mr ingbert had mentioned were here long before three years specifically with theta care unless i could be wrong mm -mm. the one the but care anywho um but that is just my opinion on Thank you. Mr. Gebert. Were you finished, Mr. Finch? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Gebert. The roads here in the village are not in the best shape. Some of them could be compared to Milwaukee. I've driven through there and they've got quite a few potholes they need uh, piled and piled with uh, more and more. Ro Jacobson Road is uh, heavily used by semis but has been in disrepair for years. Cold Spring Road was in disrepair for years. Valley Road is in rough shape. Roads should be better taken care of. Preventive maintenance is some of the best things to do to take care of our roads. We had a chip seal program. They dump a bunch of tar on your roads. They put some, they put some rocks on there. Guess what? Winter, they come scrape it all off. I was on the board, like I said, in 2013. I advocated for more money to be spent on our roads because they were crumbling. I'm sure hoping that with growth from our new businesses that we have coming into our, or our village, that we can put money towards our roads. I don't want to raise our taxes. I want to make sure that that money that these, these businesses are contributing, plus the new growth of residential, can be used to, pr and to make sure that our roads are taken care of. A lot of us on the west side have ditches. I'd hate to see the village come in and try to make us have curb and gutter like they did to some people on the east side when they put in sewers. That is very expensive. This growth could help support that, and like I said, I'd hate to see anybody have to pay any more taxes, because I'm, a, like I said, I'm a homeowner, and I sure don't want to either. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kepi. Sure. Um, am I allowed to double back on anything um, from a previous question? Well, maybe you could save that into the end if you could address okay, this question first. Okay, that'd be fine. Um, we budgeted over $2 million for road repair in this last budget cycle, so it's not like roads aren't being repaired. Um, this has been a really tough spring. I don't care where you go, their roads are in bad shape. Um, I talked to Randy, our, our street superintendent, just a couple days ago. He's had one full-time crew doing nothing for the past two, two and a half weeks, but fixing the roads, fixing potholes, and adds a second crew as they become available. So it's not that these things aren't being taken care of, maybe not as timely as some people would like to see happen, but they are being taken care of. Um, I know we've talked a little bit to change subjects about the uh, equalized value and the shared revenue. I just want to point out so people understand what we're talking about. Village of Fox Crossing with roughly 19,000 people, uh, we got $383,000 from the state. Amro, city of Amro, with a population of 353,559 people, got 816,000, almost double what, more than double what we got. So there's a lot of unfairness in how that system is put together. Um, city of Kakana, 16,000 people, $2,475,000. Why are they getting that much more than we are? So there's definitely some significant changes that need to be made at that, and that has to start at the legislation level. I, I know that the Governor e uh, Evers has got some things on proposed through the budget, whether it's going to go through or not, that's another whole question. Um, but that's something that we definitely need to address and have addressed because 
that type of revenue that would be given back to us. This is money that you people pay in, so it's your money. It's just not being given back to us to utilize to take care of some of these other things. It really makes it difficult when you're going to budget to prioritize and bring in things that need to be done. You don't want to raise taxes. You want to be careful with that. But at the same time, if you don't have the revenue, at some point the services will have to suffer. There's just no two ways about it. Either you have the money to do the job or you have to put it on the back burner and maybe try and get to it next year. Thank you. There's another road-related question um, that has to do with special assessments for road urbanization, specifically pertaining to the very high cost of the residents on West Eisner's Road. Um, some property owners are facing five and six digit bills for the road reconstruction. What do you feel is the best strategy for road urbanization in Fox Crossing, and what is the best model to fund these projects? If elected, is a wheel tax something that you would ever support? And we'll start with you, Mr. Kepi. <coughs> a lot, lot in that question. Um, as far as the road urbanization, it's always looked at carefully depending on the um, amount of traffic on a road. It's not just like you pick a road and say, let's urbanize it. Um, as far as the assessment goes, I, I think you need to understand that if the urbanization on your property includes curb and gutter, you're going to be assessed for the curb and gutter and some of the costs involved there. If it's just a road that is being repaired, resurfaced, there is no assessment for that. The village dropped doing that quite a number of years ago because it really didn't seem to be fair. Other people use that road. Why are you picking up the tab for that road repair? So if it's just a repair, resurfacing, something along those lines, there is no special assessment. If it's an urbanization where there are improvements made to the road, uh, the philosophy is, is that it should increase the value of your home. We could argue that on either side, but that's the reason that those assessments are put in place. And even there, if you're sewer and water, we have a program in place that helps defray some of the costs of having your lateral put in. So it's, it's not like we're trying to gouge people, but that's the way it works. This is things that have been like that. I don't know how else you would pay for that unless you're going to put it on the property tax roll, and then now we're back to raising taxes. So there's, there's probably not a really good answer. And what was the second? Oh, uh, wheel tax, or no, uh, yeah, wheel tax. Um, I consider that to be a little bit of a regressive tax. Um, I know some communities have gone to that because they're starving for revenue. It doesn't show up as a tax, it's a fee. Well, it's still a tax if you, you can call it anything you want to, a rose is still a rose, right? Um, I don't think it's a particularly good idea. Again, like I said, it's regressive. Um, you have a $100,000 car, you're gonna pay the same fee as somebody that's got the $55 beater in their backyard. That doesn't seem right. Um, I think we need to be a little bit more um, aggressive in finding different ways of, of funding some of those needs, uh, not just by adding fees. Thank you. Mr. Gebert. Um, like I've said before, preventive maintenance really needs to be stepped up. That's uh, one of the reasons why we have to come back and have special assessments. If we'd be taking care of these uh, problems when they were first uh, addressed or needed to be addressed, and instead of waiting, uh, costs obviously go up when you wait, uh, inflation happens, all this. So taking care of the problem when it's first uh, seen is one of the things we need to definitely do. Um, growth, you know, we, like I've said it before, we got a lot of growth going to happen in the village. That should be helping us take care of this and alleviating some problems. We don't need more red tape. We don't need more government workers. We need them to take care of the residents. Um, going on to the wheel tax, I would I definitely want to hear from what the residents wanted to, wanted for that. Um, I know it affects people in a different way. Uh, Nina did seem to do it in a different way. They uh, got businesses involved and made them actually pay on the wheel tax too. I think that would be a great idea if we happen to uh, consider that. Um, it definitely ha helps offset the cost to the residents. So. There are some things that can be done, but uh, preventive maintenance is a big thing, and that growth should uh, help us be able to pay for that pre pre preventive maintenance in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Finch. Thank you. Um, this is a uh, interesting question, a long question. Um, right off the bat, talking about the wheel tax, that is something that I think we would have to address then in the moment. As of right now, I don't think that's something that uh, I would be in favor of uh, because I don't think anybody else likes to have an increase in taxes. Maybe it's just me. But um, I agree with Mr. Gebert, especially regarding 
maintaining, maintaining, maintaining. I do think, however, that our crews have been doing an amazing job, and the budgets that have been passed in the previous years have done a really good job about making sure that things are being handled correctly. Um, it would be an interesting thought about uh, doing a, a, a like fundraise road, if you will. I've seen that in uh, the Stevens Point area, and it's something that I'd actually like to look into a little bit more. Thank you. Mr. Engelbert. Okay. I just want to make sure everybody understands. We're only talking about special assessments when we have new construction. When we're talking about when we're putting in new curb and gutter or sewer or whatever. Anything that is repair or whatever related is not paid by the taxpayer through a special assessment. I just want to make sure everybody understands that. So the only, the only special assessments we're talking about is when we urbanize a, uh, a rural road, basically. Okay. So um, as far as a wheel tax, uh, well, I would definitely think that that should go to referendum. Uh, I think the people need to decide on, on the wheel tax, not the village board. Uh, that's something I think that's important for you guys to, to weigh in on. We do, have, uh, we do have a lateral sewer program that we do help with uh, hooking up on sewers. You know, if we could maybe fix the shared revenue problems, I know I keep going back to that, but, and, and we had uh, funds available, we might be able to get creative and maybe help out some residents that are maybe having a, a hard time with their special assessment. Uh, those are things that we could look at. Uh, but um, again, you know, we have to have the funding available to do that. Um, but I, like I said, for a wheel tax, I think the people need to decide on that. Thank you. This question has to do with the fire department. Calls for fire department service have increased steadily over the past 10 years. Gear is becoming outdated and the budget has been essentially frozen. What do you plan to do to help ensure that the department receives adequate funding to keep residents safe? Mr. Engelbert. Can, can you say that last part again, please? Sure. What do you plan to do to help ensure that the department receives adequate funding to keep residents safe? Well, I think we are providing adequate funding to the fire department. Um, you have to realize that we do not have a full-time fire department. We're not like, you know, Nina Menasha or or Appleton, or even the town of Grand Chute has a much more beefed up fire department than, than we have. But we've been doing some really good things in the last few years, especially because of the 441 project, knowing that it would be harder for uh, fire crews to trans transit back and forth across the lake. Uh, we've put in the more paid on call, more part, we've actually added part time during the day so that we could, resp our response times have been, have been going down. We've done a really nice job of doing that. Um, the, you know, the real question is, in my mind, is what kind of fire department do you really want to have? Do you want a volunteer fire department? Do you want a fire department that's a hybrid? Or do you want a full-time fire department? Um, I will tell you that full-time fire departments and some of the things that Grand Chute's doing with their the hybrid department, as I call it, are very expensive. We would, we would definitely have to uh, increase uh, revenues in order to do that. But we've been doing a nice job through, uh, I think, paid on call and part-time of improving uh, response times. Uh, we've also just, we're just right now, we're going after some state grants so that we can put more part-time um, firefighters on, uh, on call or on duty. So I think we're, we're, we're pushing in the right direction. Mr. Finch. I uh, totally agree with Mr. Ingerbart about the funding and uh, dealing with the part-time and the paid-on-call. I had a friend that was actually a paid-on-call uh, firefighter and uh, I've never heard anything negative, any lack of funding, unless that was something way up top. But I feel like something like that would have been kind of slipped through the cracks a little bit. And uh, if there is a lack of funding, I think it's important to figure out where that funding needs to come from. 
Is it from the taxes? Is it from fundraising? Is it from what? Uh, in my personal opinion, I am a huge advocate for grants and uh, fundraising. I've seen a lot of different, uh, specifically dealing with firefighter unions, a little bit different than here, where they'll go out and they will host fundraisers and they will do anything that they possibly can to help to offset the costs. And I think that those are things that potentially could be looked at instead of just automatically saying we need to increase funding by X, Y, and Z. I think it's something the initiative of getting out there and working and uh, dealing with the community on that. Thank you. Mr. Gebert. Um, I'm going to piggyback on what the other two have said. The fire department, I believe, has some adequate funding already. It always uh, seemed to be getting updated equipment. Um, I know the uh, response time has been pretty consistent over the years. The question I guess everybody wants to know is if you want a full-time de fire department or a volunteer. Well, I guess that's up to the residents, like many other things. Do you want to pay more? Because a full-time de fire department is going to cost a little bit more. And as I see it, our volunteer fire department has worked great over the last, as I've, long as I've been here, 10 years. And uh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Kepi. Um, well, number one, it's not a volunteer fire department. It's a paid-on-call fire department, and there's a definite difference in that. Um, <clears throat> I served on a ad hoc fire department committee a number of years ago, uh, Chief Kiso, former Chief Kiso, put that together to look at some of the issues with the fire department, and it was primarily about response time. Um, from the time the call comes in to the time that apparatus arrives at the scene, it's pretty critical, especially if you're dealing with your house is on fire and somebody's inside or you have a relative that's choking or having a heart attack. You want that help to get there as quickly as it can. And that is always a little bit of an issue when you're dealing with a paid on call because it means that the people that are going to come and help you have to first go to the fire department. And then they get on the apparatus and then go to the scene. The response time from the fire department to the scene has always been exemplary. We've never had an issue with that. The problem has been getting people to the fire department on a timely basis. That's what it means by paid on call. Um, it's an issue. When the ad hoc, ad hoc committee put their um, program together and presented it to the people, one of the things we recommended was to start looking at converting to a full-time fire department. Nobody was interested. Nobody wanted to foot the bill for it, quite frankly, and it's very costly. So you're talking 24-7, three shifts. So you've got a lot, a lot of labor rates involved. Our fire department, if you've got a $150,000 property right now, your fire department costs you $96 a year. It's not a huge amount of money when you really think about that. Um, the other thing that I think I also want to mention is we have one of the few, if maybe not the only, fully accredited fire department that is a paid on call service. Almost every other accredited to the level that our fire department is, is a full-time fire department. So I think that speaks highly of the people that we have on that fire department, the training that they get, and everything that goes in, involved in the equipment and so on in keeping our fire department top-notch. How we pay for it is always going to be the question, something that we can resolve going forward. Thank you. This next question has to do with TIF districts. How, where, and how should tax incremental financing districts be used? I, I couldn't quite hear what the question was. This is about t TIF districts. Okay. How, um, how, when, and where should tax incremental financing districts be used? Okay. Um, I guess my first question would be, does everybody know what a TID and a TIF is? I'm not talking about a TIF between you and your spouse either. When we're talking about a TID, that's a tax incremental district that means that... The village has determined that there is a specific piece of property that is going to become a tax incremental district. That's what the TID means. The TIF is a tax, tax incremental financing. That is what the board, the village, would put together if a developer comes to them and says, hey, I want to do this on that particular property. And what that means is that we essentially defer some of the property taxes that would be assessed against the incremental value of that property. In other words, you start with a piece of land, it's worth a specific amount of money. As you develop that property, it increases in value. They pay their property taxes, we refund them a portion of that, we retain some of it for expenses, etc., that are involved in maintaining that TIF, um, and there is a specific time frame listed 
it's a 10-year TIF, at the end of the 10 years, it's done. And now they start paying their full share of whatever property taxes. There's a lot of rules and regulations. It's not just like somebody comes in and says, hey, I need some TIF money here. No, they have to prove that that particular development would not happen if it wasn't for that tax incremental financing being available to them. So this doesn't happen willy-nilly. This is something that's a very serious process, requires input. Uh, it's not just the village, it's any of the taxing uh, entities that are involved. So you're talking school districts, Fox Valley Tech, they all have to sign off on that um, for that tax incremental financing to happen. It's not just us that make that total decision. So there's a lot that's involved in it. It is a very important tool for municipalities to use to encourage businesses to come in and develop, bring in those businesses, increasing the tax base, maybe even bringing some people into the area that are going to buy homes and live in the area. So it is a very important tool that has some specific rules. It's not just something you can okay, do you. just because you want to. Thank you. Mr. Gebert, same question. Well, Mr. Kipp, you did a great job explaining those TIF districts. Uh, TIF districts are obviously bringed into, are used to bring in superior businesses. Um, sometimes a business probably isn't that superior. Some districts probably, uh, you know, like Mr. Kepi said, 10 years before they get uh, they, they got the deferred payment for 10 years. Just want to make sure that they're going to be in existence for that 10 years because, you know, given that discount and then they don't exist, that's uh, something we need to be looking at. <coughs> I have gotten some uh, calls about some of the businesses going up in the village, and uh, some aren't happy with it, some are. Some of the money we spend to bring in these these. Uh, corporations is, is quite extraordinary. I actually seen on the uh, budget, the roundabout in front of Secura cost $1.6 million. The village put up $600,000 for that. Is that really worth it to the village? I mean, sure it is because Secura is one of those superior businesses, but to spend that much money on something, we got to make sure that our business, that business is going to be able to contribute to the community through residential growth and through tax-based growth. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Finch. I really like TIFs, uh, especially when they are used correctly, which, in my opinion, uh, they have been. Currently, if I'm not mistaken, we have four of them. And I think that when they're used sparingly, they are a great asset because they are able to bring in businesses like Secura, businesses like Community First, being able to help offset the costs. Yes, in the term right here now, it might seem like a little bit but after the fact, 15 max of 20 years when that TIF is up, the benefits that you could see are just astronomical. Well, I spent four years on a planning commission trying to learn what TIFs are and, and, and how, how they'll benefit, uh, benefit us. I think we're doing a pretty good job. We do have four TIFs. One TIF is actually not happening right now that uh, that development uh, pulled out um, I think I think you got to be careful I think TIFs are really good they bring in some really good corporations like Secura Community First Wow Logistics that are going to be around for a while uh, and and that is important that they be around for a while but we've talked about on the board that we have to make sure that we're bringing um, the high quality stuff in and that we're not giving TIF money to just anybody. Uh, that's important also. Um, you only want to give that money if it's essential in order to bring that development in. As far as the, uh, um, uh, the traffic circle on CB, uh, I think that most residents that are transiting CB will be happy in the end uh, we've been told by uh, Winnebago County that they're going to make that four lanes. And with that traffic circle and all those people who work at Secura, it will make traffic flow much better. Um, we also get reimbursed from the TIF for, for the money that we spend on that traffic circle. So uh, there's, there's the way the revenue happens in that case uh, is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. So... I think that was a win-win with the traffic circle. I also think that uh, what we've done so far uh, in the village with uh, TIFFs have been great. And I think the, the village 
Uh, the equalized value is rising every year. It's all good. Thank you. This question from the audience is about water management. <clears throat> what are your ideas on improving water management to avoid street and basement flooding? Well, okay, I got a, a few things on this. Um, we have a DNR requirement right now that's being leveraged on us that says that we have to get rid of 72% of our total suspended solids. This is going to be a real challenge for the village. Um, and, and it's something that I brought up to Senator Roth, uh, uh, letting him know that uh, McMahon did a study and it's going to cost us $33 million in order to build ponds, enhance ponds, and meet that requirement. Now the DNR has been really nice to us and they're going to let us do that over 35 years. Uh, but the, the state legislature and the DNR need to relook at that. However, having said that, with stormwater, we do have some issues. Everybody knows that American Drive and the Green Valley Ditch which we have a project starting uh, this year on Chapman Avenue, which is a two-step project uh, in order to start alleviating the water that's coming from the town of Nina and divert it over to Lake, Little Lake Butamore to help there. We're also looking at ponds in order to uh, fix some of the stormwater problems we have at American, O'Hauser Park. People's basements are flooding. Uh, it's gonna be critical uh, that we take a strong look at stormwater the next couple of years and start looking at uh, where we can put ponds and where we can alleviate some of that stormwater uh, runoff. Um, McMahon is doing a good job of giving us some ideas of what to do, uh, but this is another area where more shared revenue would help us out, more money. <laughs> so... But uh, we, we know there are some stormwater problems, and I think that in the last uh, couple of years, uh, we've taken a serious look at it, and, and we're working on it very hard on the board. Thank you. Mr. Finch? So quick show of hands, if that's allowed. How many people have had their basement flood at some point? Not that many, actually. But I, I think that it's important to note that it, it does happen. I mean, it's happened to me numerous times. And uh, it sucks, flat out, it sucks. Uh, I do agree that I think that uh, ponds are a big asset. The cost of it and finding the location, however, it, it's something that's gonna take a little bit of time to do. Um, something that I've had to deal with at work working for the county parks is dealing with keeping the ditches and the certain drains cleared. Uh, and I don't know if that's something, and I, I'm going to assume that's something that the road crews have been working on, but making sure that that is being able to properly drain, especially from the, all that snow, all the ice melting and such, making sure that it's able to flow as po possibly properly. Um, I, I do think that there are good steps that have been taken by the uh, board and administration and the uh, roads department, and I, I'd like to see where we can go with that. Thank you. Mr. Gebert? Growth, the gift and the curse. New growth causes the use of land that was uh, obviously absorbing water from before. So civil engineering correctly it could prevent some of this from going on. Um, in our village, we have some ditches. I don't know how long ago they were redug. My, uh, I've lived in my house for 10 years. Mine hasn't been redug. It's a problem. So I think that's one of the big things that could be re be addressed in our villages. That. Ditches need to be taken care of. Sewers need to be making sure that they're draining the correct way. I have a sewer at my house that is about 20 yards one way, but my, my water has to drain hundreds of yards the other way. It's just amazing how it's set up. So, like I said, civil engineering done correctly is one of the biggest things that we need to do because that is obviously going to alleviate the water puddling in certain areas. So, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kepi? Sure. Um, we're aware of the problem. Um, we formed a stormwater utility a number of years ago. You see it on your water bill. That money is put in there to help alleviate some of those problems. I think it's about $180 a year right now that uh, the average homeowner is being charged. Um, that is money that is being used to develop ponds as needed. But a pond just can't be dropped any place. It needs to be specifically located and with the 
new rules coming down about the uh, particulates, the 70% reduction, the placing of those ponds is going to become even more critical. It's not something that's inexpensive. I know Greg had mentioned uh, the $30 million. That's an estimate. It probably will be more than that if we're forced to do the whole, pro the whole program as the DNR is, is, is pushing on us. Um, Every property, every development that is started part of that through the, um, it has to, you, you can't allow water to come off the property, plain and simple. If you own a, a piece of property, if there is a storm water, it has to be collected and stayed on your property. It is not supposed to be going to other people's property. So part of it is making sure that developments are done properly so they have that ability to retain the water on there. A lot of times it's going to mean ponds. Um, and that's just the nature of the beast. Uh, I know we had a problem on American Drive. We're looking at a pond there to hopefully alleviate that. Um, Jacobson Road, one of the things that's been holding up the redoing of Jacobson that one stretch is because we know that we're going to have to do some significant stormwater development there. Uh, those are all part of things that don't happen quickly. Everybody wishes they would happen quicker, but you have to do the design and the development first. The water comes from west, comes here. We're lower then the properties to the west, the water wants to go to the lake and to the river. We're in the way, plain and simple. We need to find a way to get it through our village, store it maybe in some instances, and then allow it to slowly proceed in its where it's going to go. Thank you. I'm going to try to um, combine three questions here, so I try to answer as much of it as you can. <laughs> Do you support any changes to the village's current snow removal practice, leaf collection, and weekly recycling? What was snow the last one? Snow removal, leaf collection, and weekly recycling. I still didn't hear what the last one was. Weekly recycling. Oh, okay. <coughs> That's the three questions? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the issue would be with snow removal. I think we do a pretty darn good job of getting the snow off of the roads in a, in a timely fashion, so I, I'm not exactly sure what the concern was there. You'd have to be a little bit more um, where or, or what the actual concern would be. As far as leaf collection, been a topic of discussion for quite some time. Um, Mr. Ebert mentioned something about collecting leaves. We've talked about it. It's a very expensive piece of equipment. Um, what do you do with the leaves after you collect them? They got to go someplace. Um, mulching, great idea. <coughs> Labor intensive. You have to pay people to do the job of collecting the leaves. And if you're going to mulch it, now you have another expense involved. We've had the discussion with uh, our street superintendent, and it's just not something that, unless again, we're going to add some dollars to the bottom line to help with that. It's a it's a tough choice. Um, the bagging, looking at maybe some things to do in terms of helping with bagging. Something that's it's come up. Um, Again, that's a little bit more of an east side than a west side problem. Uh, again, not necessarily good answers in, other than spending more money on it. And we have tight budgets. Not sure that that's the best answer at this point. Um, the weekly recycling, been a topic of discussion on the sustainability committee. I know for a fact that uh, my wife and I probably could go to twi uh, uh, every other week with the garbage and weekly collection of recycling because we do recycle a lot. Um, could it be done? Yes. Uh, it comes back down to the cost. We do twice a month, every other week, recycling pickup. If we're going to add to do it every week, there's a cost to that, and we'd have to decide if that's something that, as a community, that's what we want to do. Um, plain and simple, so many of these things always come back down, and the question is how are we going to pay for it? Thank you. Mr. Gebert? Uh, the snow re removal, yeah, that's, it seems to be fine. Uh, obviously, there's always places where you can pick up and uh, do a little bit better. Um, I have touched quite a bit on the leaf collection, like I said before. Five dollars and something it would have cost us one time. I know a lot of people spend way more than that just to get the darn bags. And like I said before, it's back-breaking work. Um, one of the things I remember from that leaf collection and getting the, the, the vehicle or whatever it was, the, the street department doesn't want anything to do with it. They don't want extra work. They, they just, that's just not what they want to do. Um, and, that's, and that's kind of weird because it costs us money to pick up those leaves already. So we could be dispensing that cost to take care of some of that other cost of 
like Mr. Kepi said, sh shredding the leaves and getting the mulch. And I'm sure people would pay, like uh, our neighbors in the city of Nina, pay for the mulch. So that uh, helps offset the costs. Weekly recycling, like Mr. Kepi said, the cost, it's, it is quite expensive. Um, maybe we could get some bigger cans to people who are don't have the amount in their can or even get bigger. I mean, maybe we don't have big enough cans. We could get bigger cans. Um, that's one of the ways to cut the cost on that because they're only coming by once, but the bigger can is going to help us out. And the more more recycling we have, the better uh, revenue we have coming in that's shared with us from Outagamie County. So weekly recycling is one of those things that definitely should be looked at, but it's uh, always a balance with that cost. Thank you. Well, uh, talking about snow, um, our favorite topic, especially, you know, at this time of the year, um, plowing is, uh, it's a, it's not exactly the easiest thing to do. Um, I've had a plow before, um, and it's a very fine line between hitting the snow and taking off blacktop, asphalt, gravel, whatever you want to do. Uh, I think that the uh, crews do a fantastic job. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, they go out anytime that there is anything above two and a half or three inches, which is pretty different compared to a lot of communities which are above three, um, three or four. Um, regarding the leaf pickup, I think that's something that we should hear back from the constituents. I think that's something that our elected officials should be going out hearing the input because that's another thing that's going to be affecting you. Is that something that you would want to see? Is, is, a, is a piece of equipment something that would benefit you? Or is it something that really would have no effect? Uh, regarding the recycling, personally, I have no use of having weekly recycling. But that doesn't say that Mr. Kepi, like he said, he could. I think there are alternatives, however, besides having a, uh, a weekly recycling, which, if I'm not mistaken, would almost double the cost of recycling. And that alternative is, yes, get bigger cans. <coughs> However, there is another alternative, and that is get an additional can. If I'm not mistaken, through the village, you can go ahead and get an additional can, whether it is garbage or recycling, and utilize that option. So yes, it might cost a little bit more, but in the terms of it, compared to having the entire village pay compared to one person, I think that's an option that should be at least considered. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Engelbert. Uh, on the snow removal, I know, I, I think one of the big concerns is when your snow gets removed. Um, we, that's, pro that's the biggest concern out there. That's what I hear from my constituents, and I talk to my constituents all the time. Um, you know, obviously, there's a priority system when you do snow removal. You have to get the primary and arterial roads done first because you have emergency services, um, uh, police and fire and, and, and those kind of things that you have to be able to provide to residents. So we have a plan that goes primary, secondary, and some people who are on the secondary route aren't going to get their uh, snow removed uh, as fast as people who are on the primary route. I understand that. You, I just hope that you understand that. Um, the only way to get snow removed faster for the secondary folks would be to buy more plows and hire more people, which would be money. Um, on leaf collection, the one thing I will say about the truck from what I've heard is that it's easy to do it if there's curb and gutter as far as sucking up and getting that stuff done. It's a lot harder to use that truck if you have ditches and whatever. Very difficult on the, uh, on the workers uh, to do that. So that's what I've been told. On the weekly recycling, I just want people to know that we are going to waive fees if you want to get a bigger uh, recycling bin in the next few uh, months. That may solve your problem by just having a bigger bin instead of a smaller bin. Uh, but recycling costs are going up every year. Uh, I don't see uh, recyclers dropping their cost in the future. So, um, you know, I don't think once a week, I think that would be very costly. And I don't think residents re really want to pay for that either. 
Thank you. One final question. What is your vision for the future of cross, Fox Crossing, and how do you plan to realize that vision in context of the new 10-year plan? The new 10-year plan? Well, I guess they're talking about the, uh, the, the planning committee and, uh, uh, and our 10-year plan. Uh, what I think the biggest thing is, uh, is that we're going to uh, provide uh, good housing. Um, we want to make more trails available uh, when we can. It's, it's difficult uh, to, uh, you know, get the money that you need to put trails where everybody wants to, to have uh, trails. Um, but I think that the big thing would be to, you know, keep developing, keep moving west, because I think that that's all going to become metro anyhow. Uh, one nice thing would be to have a little more shopping. When I, I mentioned the grocery store, to have a little more shopping available uh, for the west side residents. I think the east uh, side uh, residents have... Uh, a lot of shopping available close by in the west on the west side we don't so I think that that would help with the 10-year plan um, uh, and you know we just we just need to keep moving forward with uh, TIFs and attracting bi attracting businesses because uh, that's the best way to improve or uh, increase the tax base and make sure that we keep your guys's taxes right about where they're at thank you mr. Finch so I think that, uh, you know, because we're going to be growing, uh, there's no doubt in my mind that the village of Fox Crossing is going to be growing. If you're not aware, currently we are, if I'm not mistaken, 41st, 41st out of 1,200 and some odd communities in the state of Wisconsin in terms of size currently. And I think that all we can do is go up. And I think that's fantastic to see how much growth we've had over the past few years. I think that what we've been doing is fantastic, and I think that where we can go, especially with the community development, growing a little bit more, having a, almost like a uh, business district, a downtown, create a downtown, if you will. I think that those are options that could definitely be addressed. And I think that, you know, really working towards having a better community, a more welcoming community, not saying that we don't have that. I think that we do, but I think that there are ways that we can come together and become a more united village. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Gebert? Uh, quite a short and sweet one here. Um, I just want to maintain our services at designated levels, promote both commercial and residential growth, work in growing our downtown, and maintenance, maintenance, maintenance. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kepi. Thank you. Um, I'm going to make an assumption here by the 10-year plan. You're talking about the future land use map and the comprehensive plan that was just mm -hmm. completed recently. Um, <clears throat> part of that process was getting public, you people involved in what your expectations were, what your thoughts, your ideas in terms of how we are going to continue to grow and how that growth is going to take place. Obviously, most of it's going to be going in a westerly direction because that's where we have land that is still available. The purpose of that future land use map and the comprehensive plan was to give us a tool to use to develop those properties in an orderly fashion. What you don't want to have happen, and I remember this a number of times on the planning committee where there'd be this very nice development, single family homes, and somebody would come in and say, hey, I want to take that property right next to it or across the street and do, I hate the term multifamily, but that's what it was. Well, that's not fair to those people that spent the money to buy that land and put up their house on the assumption of that's the type of development that was going to continue. It was going to be designated as primarily low-density single-family homes. That's what that future land use map, the comprehensive plan, is there for, so that when somebody comes into our village, wants to see what's going to happen over the next 10, 12, 15 years, that's the tool that they use, that's the tool that we need to use as we allow these developments to go forward. That's the purpose of that document. A lot of time and dollars was spent on formulating it, and as I said, there was a lot of public input, public meetings. People were allowed to come in and comment, um, giving their thoughts, and we, our obligation then to the people that put that together is to make sure that we enforce it and allow that growth to happen in an orderly uh, fashion that just makes sense for everybody. 
Maintaining rural green space has always been important. It's one of the things when we've done surveys, it comes up time after time. One of the things we love about the community is the rural feel. That's something that was addressed as part of that comprehensive plan and that's something that we need to continue to keep front and center as we're developing. Thank you. Now our final round is for closing remarks. And Mr. Kepi, we start oh. with you. Well, give me just a moment here. <laughs> Catch your breath. Um, I guess in closing, I would just simply say that I've had the opportunity to serve the village in a number of different capacities, planning committee, sustainability committee, and now the board. Um, I like what I do here, and I like this community. I think it's a wonderful place to live, raise your family. I work here. Um, I just think the superlatives that you can, you can keep on going for as long as you want within, and most of them are true. We want to keep it that way. I want to be a part of keeping it that way. As I said, trustee means entrusting someone with something. So when I ask for your vote, I'm very clearly conscious of the fact that I'm asking you to entrust me with those responsibilities. I think I do a good job of them. I think that I'm well aware of the, how the tax dollars need to be spent. We need to work at bringing in more revenue, shared revenue. These are all tools, things that we need to work at. We can't do it by ourselves. We need to help from some of our other legislatures. So call them, write them, and tell them these are things they need to back us on. Um, but I guess plain and simply, I think I'm the best qualified person for this position, and I hope to get your vote. Thank you. Mr. Gebert. Uh, again, I'd like to thank the Women's League of Voters for putting this on tonight, and uh, all of you for taking two hours out of your night to come and uh, attend. I'm going to finish with a little story I'd like to tell about our village, elected village representatives. Fox Crossing is turning three in April, and one of our major themes the representatives campaigned on for our incorporation to a village was that we could identify ourselves different than the city of Menasha. The identity of Fox Crossing starts with its name and then is identified with symbols, landmarks, etc. I watched all the town of Menasha get scrubbed from everything. The water towers got new logos, the parks got new signs, signs changed everywhere except if you exit Interstate 41 heading north on Winchester Road. For almost three years, three vital signs in our area still read Town of Menasha. If you weren't familiar with the area, you would think you were in the Town of Menasha. It was amazing to me that seven elected officials missed these signs or felt no need to correct them. As a resident, I looked at this as an identity crisis. So in January, I brought this to the attention of the village board, and today, you will find that signs finally now read Fox Crossing. This is one of the many reasons I support term limits on elected officials. I ask for your vote on April 2nd. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Finch. I do want to prelude. I uh, do want to make a clarification and a quick apology to Mr. Engelbert. Uh, Theta Care was around. I was thinking of Theta Care Pediatrics, which, you know, being around here for the entire time for 22 years, that's the only one that I've really ever known. Uh, with the new one, that is pretty recent. So I do apology for that. Uh, I do want to say thank you to my friends and family, the League of Women Voters, everyone that's out here tonight for everything that you guys are doing. It is with you that this is all possible. Uh, if I'm elected on April 2nd, I will take your concerns and your ideas seriously. Seriously, seriously, seriously. Such as dealing with tax rates, community development, and maintaining and continuing our transparency. I will aim to be a trusted and involved community member, and I will make it known I'm working for a better tomorrow. Not just for my generation, not just for your generation, but for the generations yet to come. Again, my name is Josh Finch, and I hope on April 2nd, you'll vote for me. Thank you. Mr. Engelbert. Thank you. Um, this, is a, this is a very important job that uh, we do for taxpayers. Um, you know, I've been, I've been serving the community for the last seven years. I served four years on the uh, planning commission where I kind of grew up and, and learned uh, how local government works and what TIFs are and comprehensive plans. Uh, it was invaluable uh, experience and really helped set the stage for me to run for village board. Um, Having experience like that and three years on the board really matters. Um, I love working for my constituents. I have been walking neighborhoods uh, for the last month, and I have talked to hundreds of constituents out there uh, handing out flyers. Um, 
that is the best way for me to do my job because what I have to hear is how you want me to do my job and what you think is important. I'm a homeowner. I've been a homeowner for the last eight years. Um, I think it's important to be a homeowner and understand what's, you know, what issues you're going through. Um, my opponent, I believe, is not a homeowner. Um, I think that it's not a requirement, but I do think that it helps me and shapes my decisions when I think about what we're doing on the board. The majority of our uh, decisions that we make on our board are about homeowners uh, and that tax rate. So I just hope that you consider me on April 2nd. My name is Mark Engelbert. I love working for you guys. I've been serving my country or my community for the last 33 years, and I love doing that. Thank you. Thank you. On Tuesday, April 2nd, you may vote for one of the candidates, uh, the two candidates you heard this evening for municipal judge and two of the four candidates for village trustee. Polls are open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. You may register to vote when you go to the polls on election day. Proof of residency is required, and you must also show a photo ID, photo voter ID in order to vote. For information about voter registration, polling place, and more, go to www.myvote.wi.gov. And a, a, an additional note for you Fox Crossing voters, if you usually vote at Spring Road School, you now vote at Apple Valley Church. If you usually vote at um, Maplewood Middle School, you now vote at Fox City's United Pentecostal Church. I'd like to thank our candidates for um, answering a marathon list of questions and for doing so with a lot of diligence and thought. And I would like to thank all of you for your good questions and your patience in um, hearing that long list of questions. Thank you for coming out tonight and for making it, everyone who made this forum possible, and especially to our candidates for participating tonight. Thank you. Thank you.